I'm going to sit down. <laughs> Is it on? Is this on? Can you hear me? Okay. Um, I know we've just had two papers read, which I thought were excellent. Um, and I am going to read to you a little bit more, but I would like to stay connected, so I may give it up and um, just talk. However, I need to tell you a story. Several weeks ago, I was teaching my advanced research seminar at the end of the day on Friday. Two members were absent due to weather predictions of torrential rains. The dangers of driving were discussed, the unpredictability of the weather, the inaccuracy of weather predictions, the difficulties in making it to class, the difficulties of doing research, of focusing the mind, of spending more time with patients already difficult to spend time with, since review of the sessions brought up difficult feeling states or lack of feeling, feelings of fragmentation, a sense of losing oneself, in some cases a sense of isolation and unbearable aloneness. I think it is safe to say that while all class members are working on their papers, none of them are really enjoying the research process at this point. <laughs> Would anyone like to dispute this? I know there's some members of the class here. <laughs> It is difficult. It's the last thing I feel like doing. I do anything, clean the whole house, before working on my paper. I can't write more than one sentence at a time. <laughs> OK, I guess uh, we're resonating <laughs> with these feelings. The class is irritable. They feel inadequate, and they don't want to go crazy. Almost all are researching patients on the primitive edge, somatizing, pre-psychotic, psychotic, narcissistic or perverse. As I left my office to go to my car, the torrential rains began and I stepped up my pace, misstepped on my slightly high-heeled sandal turning my foot under, and broke it. Was this accident the result of induced feelings from the class? <laughs> Wait. <laughs> Several weeks ago, I was teaching my advanced research seminar at the end of the day on Friday. Torrential rains were predicted. I had just assumed the presidency of BGSP and had finished the first month of the new academic year. Everyone was asking me for my vision. I was aware of taking on new responsibilities and being the one the so-called buck stops with, which is an interesting expression, my class was concerned about the dangers of driving and unpredictable weather and the unpredictabilities of the research process. As I left my office to go to my car, the torrential rains began and I stepped up my pace, misstepped on my slightly high-heeled sandal, turning my foot under, and broke it. Was this accident related to my assuming the presidency? Did it symbolize my sense of assuming a huge burden, my concerns of being adequate to the job? Several weeks ago, I was teaching my advanced <laughs> research seminar at the end of the day on Friday. Torrential rains were predicted. I had been dealing with the impending separation from a family member who was taking on a lengthy work assignment in what sounded like a dangerous place. I was concerned about her safety and my culpability in her agreeing to do such a thing. As I left my office to go to my car, the torrential rains began, and I stepped up my pace, you know the rest, misstepping on my slightly high-heeled sandal, turning my foot under, and broke it. Was this accident a self-punishment for the impending separation? A plea for her to stay, self-attack instead of anger at her for going? And as I did read the very sparse literature on accidents, by the way, a possible self-sacrifice to keep her safe? Or, in light of the upcoming conference, was the accident symbolic of my somatizing tendencies? Was I bringing the conference to mind? Now, when I appeared at BGSP on crutches, I was naturally asked what had happened to me. I asked students and patients what they thought. I got many answers. I had dropped a knife on my foot. <laughs> the presidency was too much for me. I was showing people I was vulnerable so they'd be nice to me. <laughs> I dropped something in my foot while helping a daughter move. I was slowing myself down, which was long time coming. 
I was twinning with a student who had a hurt leg. I was twinning with a student who had a hurt finger. I had kicked someone, and they were in worse shape. <laughs> I had clearly become re-embodied. How do we know how to explain such events? Are there any accidents? Well, we know the answer to that, right? Which is one problem when you actually <laughs> do encounter an accident. Um, I'm going to quote Dr. Meadow from the new psychoanalysis. The analytic session is the first research tool used to delve into the subjective life in a meaningful way in order to discover connections among emotion, physiological functioning, life strivings, and death. We must concern ourselves with early pathways for the discharge of emotional tension and impulses. I believe this is what Dr. Rothman did so capably in her study, discovered connections among these realms with the three uh, long-term cases she studied very intensively. As psychoanalysts engaged in clinical work, of course, we're always researching the unconscious. So it's hard for me to make a distinction be between being a clinician in practice and being a researcher. I think this is what we do. We listen to the symbolic communications of our analysands. They consciously report their experiences and thoughts, wishes, and fantasies. But we pay close attention to the gaps between what they're telling us and what is actually being communicated in other ways by actions, by contradictory communications, maybe what's absent from the communications. And as uh, Dr. Sheftel and Dr. Rothman pointed out, we pay special attention to the feelings generated in us when we're sitting with patients and working with patients. And we observe the sequence and also nexus of associations in the sessions, verbalized and unverbalized. And from all these observations, we make inferences about unconscious meaning and motivation. This is what we do as analysts. Now there's one more thing we do beyond the analytic hour as researchers. Do you know what it is? We write everything down. <laughs> this can be the hardest thing to get someone to do. The question of how you record your observations is a very hot topic if you read the psychoanalytic research literature. And you don't want to intrude on the clinical process, obviously. So there's been a debate about tape recording sessions. I believe that came up last year when Dr. Boski was here. Um, how do you really, how do you, and my husband asked me this. I don't have dogs, so I read my talk to my husband. <laughs> <laughs> Three times. <laughs> Um, and he was very helpful because he, he asked some very important questions, and he's here today listening to it again, right? But um, he asked me, well, if you're writing things down, how do you know you're not selecting from what you're experiencing and what's going on in the session? And of course, we are selecting. We're always selecting. Um, however, it's my uh, observation that over time, Dr. Meadow emphasized that we can do research with a single case because we spend so much time with our patients. We make observations repeatedly, session after session. There's a lot of repetition in what goes on. There are repetitive communications, there are repetitive feeling states. Um, over time, uh, as the analyst, you certainly get a feel for what the uh, repetitive conflict consciously expressed and unconsciously indicated is. So if you keep writing and session after session, write down as much as you remember, you do capture what's happening over time, session by session. You also really remember what's unusual. So the unusual emotional experience, um, the occasional dream, uh, an enactment uh, or action that have, hadn't previously occurred, these things get recorded also. So when Dr. Rothman knew she wanted to study her long-term somatizing patients, she had some notes, but she had to very systematically write down what was happening in each session over a, a period of time. And that is done so that uh, you can control for your own biases in selecting, because we all, we all do that. We look for confirmatory evidence of whatever hypothesis we might have had the session before, a few sessions before. So I'm gonna, I wish I had used your husband's visual, audio visual skills, uh, Dr. Rothman, because I'm gonna read you another quote, and I 
would prefer you to be able to read it with me, but here it goes. This is another one from Dr. Meadow. She wrote a paper, as many of you have probably read, called Psychoanalysis, an Open System of Research. She wrote it in 1995, and I think it's still a very seminal paper on psychoanalytic research. She describes the single case study as the most powerful tool available to us for generating explanations that link unexplained observables. She goes on to say, this process of defining, tracking, and uncovering is, simply stated, our methodology. And she notes the importance of letting the patient direct the flow of the session. I think our, our emphasis on the contact function in modern analysis and uh, not interfering or intruding on uh, the patient's uh, communications and flow of associations is very important and helpful in the research process. Mary Shepard wrote a paper about this, published in 2004. 